Hopefully everyone is logged in and has their sound working. Does anyone have any questions on anything before we jump into our topics for today? Um, let's see. Okay, as far as this class, just so everybody's on the same page, it's a very good question. This class is for everyone who has our creator software all the way through to Maestro. So again, everyone who has creator all the way to Maestro, any of those levels, you are in the right place. As far as the intermediate class goes, the intermediate class would be for people who have Illustrator Extreme, Artist Plus, and Maestro. So anyone with Creator, these are the tools that will complete everything that you have. And again, those of you who have the higher level, you will continue on to the intermediate class. The other thing that you will find, again, those of you who do have the higher levels of software, even some of the things that we touch on today, you may have a more advanced portion of that, um, possibly a way to do it a little bit quicker. And again, we will get to that in the intermediate class. But again, everything that we do today can be done by anyone who is here. Again, before we jump into anything else, does anyone have any other questions? We are going to start off with what we are calling our advanced lettering. Again, it is going to get into that personalization toolbar that has been added to Creator and above. So I'm going to jump in here and create just another new file over here. So what you're going to find is that our flyout toolbar is off here to the left. The one that we are starting off with is going to be this one at the bottom. And again, just realize with any of your flyout toolbars, once you have selected something from there, this will change whatever you have selected. We are going to start with Word It, which is what's showing right now. That's the heart with the letters in it. So again, if I go ahead and click on Word It, you're going to see that that Word It screen is going to come up. So the first thing that you are going to select is going to be the shape where you want the words to go inside of. So you can see you've got all of these different options here. So you can select one of these. Then you're going to tell it what type of a stitch you want to use for the shape. So it could be a run, a bean, a steel stitch, an applique. So whichever one of those you want. So I'm going to pick a steel. And you can make that item any size that you want. So let's say that I want this to be six inches high. Then you can start putting in all of the words. Make sure that you are putting in a comma between them. Now that comma is going to allow those to be broken up and rotated. If you put something together, so I'm going to put these last two words together, you're going to see that they have to come together. Then you can select your font. Again, once you go ahead and hit generate, it's going to put those words inside of the heart. So remember I told you like where I put the is love as one piece, 
See how that has to come together? So wherever you put the comma, that's going to allow that to be able to be separate and rotated and resized in all of that. Once you're ready to sew, you're going to go ahead and click on the OK button. Does anyone have any questions on that? As far as your words being generated outside of the box, what you have to watch out for is really going to be what size you're trying to tell it to make the lettering. So I let mine start at 0.25. Um, you also can't have a real tiny shape. Like I made this six inches. So you can't really start to put a bunch of letters into like a two inch shape. So kind of watch what you're trying to tell it to do. Um, I would say the larger the shape, the more successful you will probably be with this whole concept. Um, again, sometimes it's also the font, so kind of see what font you're trying to use. Some fonts work better than others when it's trying to do this. Hmm. Um, only if you're still having issues and you did exactly what I did, uh, what I would tell you to do is also look under your help section and look at about, are you using 7025 as the version of software? Okay. I would say go ahead and try it again. If you continue to have issues with it always appearing outside, um, I would go ahead and see if support can possibly log into your system and see if there's any other changes that you may need to make. But I have seen it definitely go outside the shape when it just can't fit. As far as the new software, it's definitely something you have to get used to. Um, if you have jumped in if you have updated or upgraded and you have not taken the embroidery essentials part one and two that definitely goes through a lot of these toolbars um, but again probably the biggest change has been these flyouts so these flyouts should appear down the left hand side those used to be complete toolbars previously um, so hopefully um, if you have not already taken those classes, you do go ahead and do so. Um, but the more you use these flyouts, I think you're going to find that you'll probably like them because it's not taking as much screen space up this way. The more things you had laid out on your screen, the more area that you actually lost. So I know a lot of people like it better because of that. Do you have any other questions on this one before we jump into our next part? of our personalization toolbar. Okay, so let's jump and grab another new window. The next one of these in our personalization toolbar that we're going to use is going to be your import emojis. So when you go to import emoji, what you're gonna notice in your properties over here is that you're going to get a drop down. That's going to allow you to select from all of these pre-digitized emojis. So whichever one you select, so you can select one, click and drag, and it's going to bring it onto your screen. Then you can go ahead and hit the enter key, and it's going to process the stitches. So you can put multiple emojis up here. You can do whatever you want with them. So it is going to, yes, you can go ahead once you've done that 
come in here and select another one. Hit your enter key and it's going to process. Now the next thing that you can do with that, so let's say that we go in here and we hold this down again. So you're gonna see that you have other things in here. So we can actually go to what's called random repeat, which is another new tool in this personalization toolbar. When you go into your random repeat, it's literally doing just that. It is randomly repeating these across your screen. So you can always increase this. Let's say you want the width to be 10 inches. So that's the overall width of your entire design. You can hit apply. And again, obviously the more space that you give it, the more that it can repeat these. Once you're ready to sew those out, you can just go ahead and click on the OK button. So it has now randomly repeated those. The next thing in that personalization toolbar that we had is our color it tool. So that's going to allow you to recolor what's on your screen. So when you come in here under color it, Obviously, Lighten is going to do just that. It's going to lighten things. You can also come in and darken it, so it's going to make the colors darker. With Tint, you can actually come in and select a color, and it's going to use that to tint it. So these are all going to be different color greens. Obviously, Random is just that. It's going to randomly pick colors for you. Then you can also pick a theme. So when you come in here and you pick a theme, you can go ahead and say, okay, I want to pick browns and greens. And it's going to go ahead and select those for you. Does anyone have any questions on either one of these? Well, actually, all three of these. Right, these are all found in that flyout. So when you click and hold, and that's probably the most important thing about these new flyout toolbars, is click and hold. So that's what's going to get it to fly out. So the next one we want to look at, and again, we can look at our emoji tool again. So let's go ahead. We're going to use one of those emojis again. So you can select from your drop out, your drop down menu, click and drag, hit your enter key. So the next thing we want to look at is the advanced duplicate. So we can select this, come up here to our duplicate tool, control and left click is going to bring this up on our screen. So once you've brought this up on your screen, you can start to set the settings up here. So let's say that I want five across, six down, Again, you can start to set a distance. So once you have it, so let's go ahead and apply for a minute. So then you can start to set the distances. So see, so you can actually go horizontally, either closer or further away. So you'll be able to do any of these. Actually, let's just put a big number in here so you can see it. And then the same thing with vertical. You can type in a number or you can use the up and down keys. 
You can also even go in and angle these. So whatever you want, you've got control over it here in your box that comes up. We're going to click on OK. And it's going to bring it up on your screen. Everybody with us on that one? All right. The next one we want to look at is your rainbow lettering. So let's just go ahead. And with rainbow lettering, you have to start off with text. So you're going to start off with any of your text baselines to create that original text. You're going to, in this case, I'm drawing an arc, so I'm going to draw my arc. So once you have your lettering on your screen, if you go back into your baselines, you're going to see rainbow text is an option. So rainbow text is doing just that. It is literally coming in here and making each letter a random color. Let me just go ahead and put a background behind this. So it's gone in here and it's randomly selected the colors and made each one of these letters a different color. Does anyone have any questions on any of our new personalization tools before we jump into our digitizing? Does anyone have any questions? Okay, I'm going to actually, so we don't start running out of room on our screen here, I'm going to close these down. So as far as digitizing, because that's where we're headed now. So digitizing in general is converting those non-electronic media items, again, those printed materials, into a format that can be read by your embroidery machine. While some people think it is as easy as just scanning something and hitting poof, you're an embroidery design, it is definitely not that simple. So all of those things that we were discussing in our embroidery essentials class are still going to hold true when we're digitizing. It's just now we're in charge of making all of the decisions. So our greatest challenge, whether or not we are the embroiderer or the digitizer, are making stitches so well on a given fabric. So just remember those stretchy fabrics will always distort your stitches. Your thick fabrics will often have your stitches sinking in and your textured fabrics are going to result in uneven stitching. So again, these things are definitely going to challenge you and the only way that you are really going to be able to do these correctly is to practice and experiment. So what we are going to do, and you're going to see us approach this in a couple different ways, is we're going to start off our digitizing journey with acquiring a piece of artwork on our screen that serves as a background template that we are going to plot things on top of. 
as the digitizer, you are now in charge of all of the important decisions. So the best thing for you to do is always sit down and analyze that art before you ever plot a point. You don't want to back yourself into a corner. So if you just give yourself a couple minutes to look at it, you're going to be easily then able to determine the stitch type. You're going to have to also know the proper settings. So again, while we can use our recipes, you may want to use different settings than the recipes are calling for based on the complexity of the design that you're doing. So as opposed to setting an across the board recipe, you may put those settings in yourself. Again, that's a choice you're going to make. You're also going to need to determine the sewing sequence. So it's up to you to know what's going to sew first, what's going to sew second. You are also going to need to put in all of your lock stitches and trims. So every important decision of the design is now going to be in your hands. Once you have completed that basic analysis, you are going to begin creating those stitches by plotting them on top of your artwork using your software and your mouse. So as far as the artwork images that we are concentrating on, we are concentrating on our graphic file formats to start with. Those are going to be things like your bitmap files, your JPEGs, and your TIFF files. So just realize that those types of files are going to be a series of tiny little pixels or dots. So when you're viewing them at the original size, they may look great. They may be completely legible. You can see them. They look wonderful. However, you start zooming in, which is what we do a lot while we're digitizing. We need to be able to zoom in and see exactly what we're plotting. And you may find that those dots all of a sudden start to break apart and they get further apart from each other, which is what's really causing them to be fuzzy and blurry for you. So when you're bringing in your artwork, I would say bring it in at least the size of your finished product, if not larger. If you bring it in larger, you can always shrink it. So shrinking pixels are always going to give you a better quality image than you trying to take that tiny little business card logo and blow it up to a jacket back. Now, as far as scanning goes, we are going to be scanning outside of the software. So when you go and you're scanning an image, if you do not already have it saved, you are going to use whatever scanning software came with the scanner that you purchased. You're going to save that design to a folder, and then you are going to load it to your screen for digitizing. So the first stitch type that we're going to deal with today are running stitches. So those running stitches are your most basic stitch type. Some people call them a normal stitch. Some people call them a walking stitch. Again, it's very similar to what you would see come off of a regular sewing machine. They are commonly used for your outlines, your fine details. They can be straight or curved. So you'll see that you can use straight points or curved points. So if you're looking at your artwork and trying to figure out if something should be a running stitch, think of those running stitches as something you are going to draw with a fine tip pencil or pen. For those of you who like the mathematical numbers of all of this, a running stitch has to be, so again, any stitch has to be at least 0 0.03 inches to sew. Your machine filters everything else out. So if it's too short, your machine actually filters it out. So usually you are looking at something that is at least 0 0.03. So when you are plotting your running stitch, you're going to select the run tool. You are placing a series of anchor points that are defining the shape or path of the line. They are not necessarily going to represent where all of your needle penetrations are going to be. Again, your needle penetrations are actually your stitches. So that's going to be determined by your stitch length and something we call a drop run stitch.
So we're going to jump into our software. Again, when you create a new file, just like we said, if you prefer to work with the recipe, by all means, you can go to your new design wizard and you can select whatever material you're going to sew on. We are going to bring up our image. So I'm going to come up here to image and load. So wherever you have your design saved, that's where you're going to look. Mine happen to be on an external hard drive. But again, yours are going to be wherever you save them. So we're going to start off with our shapes one exercise. What's really important that you need to understand is that when you are bringing art onto your screen, all your computer sees is a piece of white paper. So if I come down here and change my background color, see how there's a piece of white paper on here? Your computer has no idea what is on the piece of white paper. All that it knows is that there is a piece of white paper. So when you are resizing your design, it is resizing the entire piece. So the reason I'm pointing that out is that if you are scanning this yourself, I would make sure that you are cropping it as close to what you are actually going to digitize so that when you are setting the size parameters, that what you are typing in makes sense. Because if you have a tiny little design in the middle of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, what it sees is the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. So if we come up here to our backdrop select tool, so I'm going to left click on backdrop select. I'm going to get a new cursor and I can right click on top of my art. So delete is pretty self-explanatory. Delete is going to delete the artwork from your screen. Now, when you're using rotate or resize in these drop downs here, it is expecting you, it's more of a visual, it's expecting you to actually click and drag and move the image around. So if I go to rotate and I click and drag, see how I'm visually doing this? It's also telling me how many degrees down in the bottom left but again, most people use it as more of a visual. Same thing with resize. Again, when you are resizing, you're pulling on the artwork and you can see down at the bottom, it's giving you a size. You can also come in here and flip. So flip is your mirror image. So you can flip horizontally, you can flip vertically. Now, as far as save as from here, save as from the drop down here is allowing you to save this somewhere other than with the design you're creating. So when you are saving your PXF file, the default is to save the piece of art that's on your screen with the PXF file that you are creating. So the only time you should have to use save as from here is if you are going to be saving this somewhere other than with the design you are creating. Now the next one that we have is our reference tool. So with reference tool, it's actually kind of cool because what you can do with it is obviously type. So when you go into reference tool, you can type in the size or what you're going to see is that you have these points. So see how you've got points here? So whatever it is that you are actually creating, you can go in here and start plotting points here.
and then type in the size. Okay. So sometimes if you have it cropped, that you could use that. Everybody with me on that? Yes, we could do that again. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes if you want to go in here and bring in guidelines, you can absolutely bring in a guideline. So if you want to bring in a guideline so you know where they are, let me just make sure I've actually got these guidelines where I want them. So let's say I know that I am going to crop this. So you're not really cropping it in here. You're just coming in here so you know where to put those points. So I'm going to kind of crop out so I don't want this in there when I'm putting in the points. So I can come in here, go to my image, backdrop select, right click, go to reference tool. You can actually start to plot these points. So I'm going to put one here, one here, and one here to follow those guidelines. So what is going to resize is what's in the box. So if I want that to be six inches, I can type in six, hit resize. So it hasn't actually cropped the image, but it's only resized what I put in the box. So if you want to get rid of those guidelines, remember under view, you have remove all guidelines and it's going to allow you to remove those guidelines. Now, as far as zooming in or zooming out, remember that your regular zoom tool is a mode. So the best thing to do when you are zooming in, especially while you're digitizing, is to use the track wheel on your mouse. So with the track wheel on your mouse, and it is preset for zoom in and zoom out, as you start to roll it, see how it's going to zoom in on that image. And this can be done even when you're plotting points. If you were to go to that regular zoom tool, the letter Z on your keyboard, while you are plotting points, even if you weren't done plotting points for that shape, it is going to finish it for you. So we're going to come over here to our run stitch. We'll pick a color. Now, if you don't have that little curve next to your cursor, we're going to be working with the quick draw tool today. So that's the one we want to use. So you're going to hit the letter Q on your keyboard. So just remember with the letter Q, when you left click, you get a straight point. When you right click, you get a curve. So I'm going to left click to start this. I can hold my shift key. Now remember that allows you to actually be within 15 degrees, but if you're just moving it straight across or straight down, that's going to be perfectly straight. Bring it over to that corner, left click, pull down, left click, pull it over, left click. As much as you want to connect this yourself, don't do it. Because when you do that, it's not actually welding the shape together. So to weld that shape together, you're going to hit the letter O on your keyboard. That's going to finish your shape. Then you're going to hit the Enter key on your keyboard. Once you hit the Enter key on your keyboard, it is going to finish that piece. I'm going to hit the letter S for Select going to get me out of that tool. Now to hide your artwork. So if you ever need to hide your art, it's the letter I on your keyboard. And in this case, we're going to hide this for a minute. Let's put this in 3D so you can see what we've got. So first of all, you may have noticed that it automatically plotted my start and stop points. So whether or not you're going to plot them yourself or the computer is going to automatically do it for you, and in this case, you might have to move them, is based on how you have your computer set up. So when you're under Tools and you go to User Settings, 
We're going to come in here under environment. And you're going to see that you've got manual start and stop. So you can turn it on so that you can plot them every time. If you go ahead and turn it off, it's going to do it for you. I actually have mine off except for my complex fills and my satins. This is a personal preference. So whichever one of these you want to turn on is fine. Usually when I'm plotting a running stitch, it's the start and the stop point are in the spots I want them to be. So I don't bother with that one, but I do want to plot my own start and stops for my complex fills and my satins, which is why I chose that. So in this case, I can move my starts and stops around. So usually what you're doing is you're starting. So in this case, it doesn't matter where we start because it's the first shape. But we want to end closest to where we're going to next. So that would be over here. So I can always move those myself. So if I put my art back up, you can see that's going to be next. So that's why I put this over here. Now, as far as my settings for my running stitch, first of all, you can see over here in my flyout that the run style that I'm using is a regular running stitch. The stitch length is 0.12. So what's happening over here is it's doing as many stitches as it can that are 0.12. So, you know, I only plotted four points and technically the fifth one is the other corner. But you can see that I obviously have more than five stitches because it's taking that stitch length and it's breaking those lines up into the individual stitches. So it is taking into account what we call the stitch length as well as what we call the drop run stitch. So right now the drop run stitch is set at anchor. So what's happening is every one of those little dots that I plotted is an anchor point. And what it does to keep the integrity of your shape is it forces a needle penetration wherever there's a point. So again, if you do exactly what we did here and plot as few points as possible, you're going to get great results using that drop run stitch at anchor. It's going to keep the integrity of your shape, your stitch lengths to be pretty consistent. The only time that I would warn you against the drop run stitch is for those of you who really feel the need to put like a thousand points for a circle. If you put a thousand points for a circle and you have your drop run stitch on there, you are not going to have an even stitch length because it's trying to put as many stitches that are 0.12 as it can, but it has to physically drop a stitch at every anchor point. So if you happen to be the person who puts tons and tons of points, that's where you're going to run into an issue here with the at anchor. So in that case, you might want to turn it off. Now, if you want to make a running stitch look bolder, you're going to change the style. So usually we're sewing it more than one time. So under run style, we can select two ply. Now you'll notice my red triangle, my stop bead has disappeared. Because when you're doing a two-ply, it literally is doing two times around the object. So it has to start and stop in exactly the same spot. Now, another one that you can select, so if I go back here to run, I can also, under the stitch style, which is down a little further, I can select bean or half bean. So a lot of people will refer to a bean stitch as a three ply. So again, this does have our movable start and stop points. Now, as far as what it looks like, so let's go into our stitch select and start to go forward here. So with a bean stitch, what you're gonna see is it's gonna stitch forward and then stitch backwards. So see how you've got forward and backwards here? So that's why a lot of people say it looks like a three-ply because when it backs up on itself, it's kind of looking like a three-ply at that point. So it's definitely bolder than your two-ply. 
Now, if we were to go in here instead of a regular bean stitch, we use a half bean stitch. You're going to obviously, even from the picture, see that there aren't as many stitches. Because what's happening with a half bean stitch is that it is doing the equivalent of two stitches forward and then backing up one. So see, you've got a long stitch and then a short stitch. So that's what you're getting there. That looks great on, on objects like this that are very straight. Um, when you start to get in the curve, you're going to find that it doesn't work as well on the curve because trying to make a long stitch and then a short stitch bend around a curve is usually pretty difficult. So it's usually not one we would use on a curve, but if you're trying to cut down on some of your stitch counts, you can definitely go in here and switch that to a half bean if you've got the straight areas. Now you are also, like we said, responsible for lock stitches and trims. So you're gonna notice that you can do it in either spot. So again, Pulse likes to give you lots of different ways to do things. You can always come over under commands or connections and put those in, or you can do it from your ribbon interface at the top. So I can put in my start lock, my end lock, and my trim. Everybody with me on that? So let's go on to our next one. So we're going to get that running stitch. We are going to select our color, left click. Again, this is actually within 15 degrees, so we can actually use that shift key to plot this. O to close, hit the enter key. Again, like I said, I don't have mine where I have to plot by start and stop, so I'm moving mine. I'm going to put on those lock stitches and trims. Now, when you get into a curved area, like we said before, that curved area, you're going to need to right click. So we're going to start off with our running stitch. Again, Q for quick draw. Select your color. Left click. And then you're going to right click to get your curve. Again, this is averaging where you put your points. So again, you don't have to put a ton. But you can usually see where you have to put ones as you start to drag them. You're going to see if it's going to fit your shape properly. When we get up here, we're going to left click at the end and then hit O to close it. Hit the enter key. So very similar to our at anchor when we have a curve. If you don't want it to cut off the ends of your curve, you want it to be a little smoother around those ends, instead of drop, run, stitch, at anchor, we can select cord gap. So you can see it's already gone in and added some extra stitches to make that curve smoother. So here's that circle that everybody always thinks that they need a thousand points on. You definitely don't need a thousand points for a circle. Left click to start it. Right click. Right click. Right click. Come all the way up here. Left click. O to close. Hit the enter key. Again, if you want to turn on the cord gap, we can definitely do that. Now, 
Now, another thing that we have with our software is something called unlimited back and forth. So if something is digitized the same way as another stitch type, you can actually just go in and switch between them. So a running stitch is digitized the same way as steel stitch. So if I came into my convert button, which is also the equals key on my keyboard, I can select steel and it's going to make that into a steel stitch. So again, a steel stitch falls in the same category as a satin path, which we're gonna deal with in a little bit, but it is digitized as a line. And then the line itself we go into the properties, has a width. So you can see right now the default is 0 0.08. So let's kind of come down here. So we are going to do our next shape and then we're going to get into some more of our steel properties over here. So you've got a steel tool so you can select it, select your color, left click to start it, right click, left click, right, left, left, right, left, enter. So when you have your item selected, you're going to go to that steel tab to see the different properties. So first of all, like we said, it is defaulting to 0 0.08 as the width. Then we have what's called a steel inset. So we all know that these are the points that I plotted. You can see the red points. And the steel inset is saying how much of the stitch is on either side of the line that I drew. So the default is 50%. So half the stitch is on one side, half the stitch is on the other side. Now let's say I want to change that. Let's say I go in and I put 90. So right now, 90% of the stitch is above the line. 10% is below. If you went the opposite way and you put 10, it goes the opposite way. 10% is above the line. 90% is below the line. So you can always shift how that is appearing. On the screen. So again, you can see there is a back to your 50%. Now you don't have angle lines when you are doing steel stitch. So if you want the stitches to turn a little bit differently, you're going to have to put in an angle. So if you put in a negative number, so let's just make a really obnoxious one. So if I put in minus 25, it actually just caused all of these stitches. See all these stitches here now? They have actually gone to the left 25 degrees. So left is negative so if I do that same thing in this direction now they've all gone 25 degrees to the right so that's how you would shift them so you can't shift individual areas of a steel you are shifting all of the stitches a particular amount now another real important concept with the steel stitch is scale width so you can see right now my scale width is unchecked so as far as what that means for you, if your scale width is unchecked, whatever you have typed in as the steel width is going to stay consistent. So no matter what size I make the overall size of this design, it is going to make sure the steel stitch is always staying whatever is in the properties. Now, if you want the steel stitch to automatically get larger and smaller when you change the overall design size, then you're going to put a check mark in the scale width.
So if it's unchecked, it will always be what's typed in. If there's a check mark, obviously at this size, it's going to stay that's that 0 0.08. But if I make the overall design larger and smaller, it is going to change the width proportionally. Now we also have what we call steel corner. So there's an auto corner that you can turn on. So if I come in here and turn on my auto corner, see how it's automatically figured out what type of a corner to do here? It's also giving me the opportunity to change the shape of the corner. So right now they're considering this a sharp corner because it comes to like a point here. Now, if I come in here and turn on bevel, with a bevel, a lot of people used to call this a hand-sewn corner. So what's happening is you are allowing for the push and pull. So right now, as this sews, it's going to push and become longer so that it's actually going to be what it looked like a minute ago when it finishes sewing. So on your stretchier materials, you may find that that, makes allow, that allows for that pushing of the material for that stretch. Now they also have what they're calling a round. So it looks very similar to your sharp. So here's your round, here's your sharp. So the sharp comes to a more defined point and this is your round. So again, it just depends on what you want that to look like. Again, we still have to make sure that we come in here and put in our lock stitches and trims. And we can get our steel stitch, select our color, left click, hold that shift key, left click, right, left, hold your shift key, left, and enter. Let's get our running stitch again, just to kind of show you they're all digitized the same way. Left click, right click, right click. So again, here's our running stitch. And remember, we have that unlimited back and forth. So I can come up here to convert, make that into a steel. The other thing it can actually be is what's called brush. So that's our other tool that this could be. So with brush, it looks very similar when you start off as a steel stitch, but when you go into the properties for your brush tool, you can actually taper the end. So it's trying to look more like if you were um, creating like script lettering and you were hand drawing it. So if you sign your name type of a thing. So you can see how I just tapered this end off. So I just tapered the one end. So you can do the start, the end. You could taper both of them. You can also change the angle. So if you go to more of a fixed angle, and I'm going to have to turn off my underlay for this. So turn off my underlay. So it's going to only go in the one direction. So it just depends on the look you're trying to achieve. This definitely will look more like handwriting if you're using it that way. So if we take this one here and we change it to a brush and then we'll taper both ends. So that just tapers it, but again, it's still keeping it. It's not doing it more like a handwriting would. So those are the two.
Does anyone have any questions on those? Does anyone have any questions? Um, as far as I'm not tapering the ends of the steel stitch, you have to change that to a brush. So I change this instead of a steel. So this is a steel. So you can see at the bottom, this says it's a steel. Now your brush is going to look very similar. But again, you can see down here it says brush. So that's what I've changed it to. That's what gives you the ability to come in, use the brush settings. Tell it that you want to taper it and be able to come in and change how it's working. Yeah, if you change this to a 3D, so if I change this to a 3D and turn this off, so that's what you're going to get if those are fixed. So these are the different settings. Does anyone have any other questions? All right. So we are going to jump into our next stitch type. Our next stitch type is our satin path. So again, with our satin path, if you are looking at it with a true satin as the pattern, it is a stitch that's going to zigzag back and forth one stitch at a time. It is going to give you a raised appearance. They're going to be used for lettering, small areas, and sometimes they're used for borders. They do have what we call multiple angle lines. So they have the capability of curving and staying with the shape of the design itself. If you are looking at your artwork and trying to figure out if something should be a satin path, think of it as something you would draw with a narrow paintbrush. For those of you who like numbers, remember a satin path has to be at least 0 0.04 inches and it can't be any longer than a half inch. Otherwise, your machine is going to want to trim it. When you are creating it, it always has to be a closed shape because the stitches are actually going to come between the two parallel sides that make up your shape. So let's jump back into that page we were working on. So 
So here is our Satin Path tool. You're going to select your color. Again, I'm using Quick Draw, which is Q on my keyboard. Again, if you ever need to get rid of a point, just remember that's backspace. O to close, hit the enter key. Now, because of the way that I had changed my properties, it's asking me where I want to start sewing. So I want to start closest to where I ended and closest to where I'm going to next. Then I need to click and drag to place all of my angle lines. So it is now up to me to determine where the angle line should be placed. Then you're going to hit G for generate. Again, it's up to you to go in and put in all of your lock stitches and trims. So we're going to look at some settings in a minute, but let's go ahead and get these three up here. So again, you're always going to create your shape and it's got to be closed. So you can see in this case, I'm using that shift key. You can see how crooked that art really is. Now, a lot of it's just because it's just not really clean. So we're going to put this last point here. Hit O to close, hit the enter key, tell it where you want to start, where you want to stop, click and drag to put in your angles, G to generate. So we're going to go around this shape. O to close, hit the enter key, tell it where you want to start, where you want to stop. Put in those lock stitches and our trim. So you can see over here that our pattern is satin. Now, if this starts to get long and you feel that it's going to get too long to actually sew a satin, instead of using satin as a pattern, we can click on that down arrow and select from the drop down menu. Again, you can see some people don't always like the look of this, but it is what they call a turning fill. So the pattern tries to turn with the angle lines that I've put in. So this is part of our standard patterns. And you also, instead of standard, can select carved tile. Again, when you've selected your carved tile, it actually have a, has a carved tile pattern box. So you can come in here and select from any of these patterns. Now with some of these, like the one I picked on here deliberately, so with some patterns like this that have the large carving into it, if you want to use that and you're afraid that this is going to become too long to stitch properly, you can always go into your quality control, 
change that split. So I'm going to put mine on a random split and then put whatever you want the, the maximum stitch length to be. So this way, if it ever exceeds that, then it's going to add extra needle penetrations in that area. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions on that? anyone have any questions on that? If not, we are actually at a great place to let you take a quick break. After the break, we're going to look at our complex fills. We are going to do a design from beginning to end. We are going to get into importing a vector file and look at what we can do with that. And we'll also look at some of the other add-ons for, um, some people will call them advanced editing. Um, I guess it depends on how you look at it. But we'll kind of look at those tools and show you how those work. If you do have questions, feel free during the break to put those questions in the chat box. Again, let's give you about 10 minutes and then we are going to jump into our next portion. So again, everyone have a wonderful break.